Welcome back everyone to Math Explore Infinity. So um, in today's video, we are diving into a powerful theorem that actually has um, deep implications in functional analysis, um, notably the Azila Scully theorem. So, but before we dive into the details, um, let's create a mental picture, right? So just to, um, to make things um, more accessible or understandable. So imagine you find yourself in a beautiful garden, right, filled with a vast array of blooming flowers, right, each representing um, a different continuous function. So now, um, I mean, of course, you are not just there or here to, to enjoy the view, right? So you are on a quest to understand how these functions actually behave over time. So it's like being a, a gardener, right, tending to, to this mathematical garden of, of functions. So um, as you wander through this vibrant garden, right, you realize that not all areas are actually the same. Some sections are densely populated with flowers, right? While others are more scattered. So the Azela um, Ascoli theorem actually becomes your trusty gardening tool, right? Helping you to, to identify precisely um, which part of the garden um, are pre-compact. I mean, in I mean in this analogy, pre-compactness is actually akin to finding those areas in the garden where the flowers are actually um, so tightly packed right, that you can be confident in their predictability and stability, for instance. I mean, it's like, um, I would say, um, like discovering those well-tended flower beds, right, that require um, minimal effort to, to maintain. So in this video, we will, I mean, we will become um, um, gardeners, right, of mathematics, exploring the Azela Scully theorem's role in determining um, pre-compactness within the space of continuous functions, right? On the compact metric space, of course. So just like a gardener understand um, which areas need special attention, we will learn how to spot subsets of functions that actually exhibit um, exception, um, I would say, um, except, oh, sorry, um, let's say that again exceptional um, properties in our mathematical garden. So if you are actually, um, I mean, if you are ready, so I think we can start, right? So um, we start with a definition. So, oops, so definition. So a subset, we call it H. Oops. A subset H, right? Calligraphic H of a compact metric space. The compact metric space um, KG is pre compact. If its closure is compact, right? So this means that closure of H um, is compact, of course. I mean, this is good. So I have an example. Every bounded set um, say in Rn, right? You can replace R by C if you want, is pre compact. Right? So this is basically I mean consequence of um the find the well so let's have a look at the proof just a short proof right so if um h for instance is actually a subset of rn right it's bounded then you agree with me that there exists oops 
the resistive radius are positive, right? Such that H is actually contained into this cube, right? But this cube is actually, um, this is actually compact, right? Because this is by Hein Borel plus Titanov. So, hence you can conclude that the closure of H is, is compact. So, we need to good. It's compact um, as close subset. of the compact metric space. Good. Now let's have another definition. So definition. So let KG might be, I mean, a metric space. Right, and let, um, let epsilon positive, then H, the subset of K, right, is called is called um, epsilon net if oops I think I need to precise epsilon net for for k right um, if k is actually the union of the ball centered at x and radius epsilon, right? x belonging to h. Good, so another definition somehow. So this the space k is called um, totally bounded. This is another definition. It's called totally bounded. If for each epsilon positive, right, there exists a finite, a finite epsilon. Epsilon it. Okay, and then we take another um, kind of definition. So a subset A of K is um, is totally bounded. So let me just find the right color. Is totally bounded, right? with um, A and O with the metric induced by K is totally bounded. Okay, good. So I think we are now ready to state our first proposition. So proposition Let's call it one star. So let um, KG be a complete, here we need completeness, a complete metric space.
and let h right be a subset of of k let me hide that complete it's actually very crucial so then the following are equivalent number one h is pre-compact i mean the closure is compact so the second thing is that um, h is totally bounded it's totally bounded so uh, maybe I'll record again what it means so this means that for every epsilon positive there exists x1 up to say xn in h right such that H is contained into the union of ball centered at xi and radius epsilon i running from one up to up to n. Okay, so in the complete metric space, right, um, the subset of I mean of k, right, is pre compact if and if it is totally bounded. So proof. So we start with the first implication. One implies two. So um, of course, let's assume. Let's assume that um, H is pre-compact. And let's show. that h is totally bounded so for that we are going to use um let's use a black box so let me just show the oops so black box i mean this is a proposition that we are not going to prove so what does it say? Um, let KG be um, the metric space. Then The space kg, I mean, is complete and totally bounded. If and only if, right? Kg, you can write the k. Oops, there's something wrong. Like something wrong with my pencil, but that's okay. So kg is if and if kg is, is compact. It looks like the so let me just where is it? Hmm. Kg is compact. Okay, so moreover. Um, this is another kind of corollary. Um, moreover, if H is actually um, a non-empty subset of K, right, and K is totally bounded, then 
H is typically bounded. Okay, good. So then let's close this black box. As I said, we are not going to COVID, right? So let me just find a way to close it. So Because this is actually the perfect way to, to waste time. Okay, not bad, well, okay, so we assume that um, H is actually pre-compact and then we want to show that H is totally bounded. Okay, good, so since since the closure of H is compact, right, because I mean, we assume that H is actually totally bounded so the closure of h is actually compact so by our black box the closure of h is totally bounded and hence H is totally bounded again by our black box. Right, because it's actually it's actually a subset of of the closure of it. So we are done with the first um, implication. So now two implies one. So let's assume. that H is totally bounded. Oops. Okay, so let's prove that, um, I mean, we want to prove that The closure of H is compact. Good. So, um, since H is totally bounded, right? The closure of H is, is totally bounded as well. I mean, you can actually prove it, right? I mean, you can do it as an exercise. So, prove it. Right? That if you have a set that is totally bounded, then the closure of the set is also totally bounded. Okay. Um, so, H by is totally bounded, right? However, H bar, I mean, the closure of H. Somehow my pencil is not responding. I don't know why, but that's okay. So however, um, the closure of H is actually a subset of K, right? Let me say close. Subset of a complete, remember, K was complete, of a complete metric space.
is the right so we'll just embrace that h is itself um, complete right i mean a close subset of a complete metric space is itself complete again you can actually prove it so um hands i mean this is by black box this is compact so and then we are done i mean this is basically what we i mean we had to prove so now we are actually headed to state i mean the core theorem of this video so this is uh, let's call it um theorem 4.25 And this is as coldly as ever. Hmm. This color missing. Let me just find a good. As coldly as ever. Okay, so. What does it say? Mm. Let K G right. Oops. So let K G be a compact metric space. And let now H be a subset of the space of continuous function, right? On the compact metric space K. So now um, H is pre compact. Right? I mean, of course, with respect to the norm topology, right? Um, the space of continuous function if and only if number one or a h is bounded right so this means that the supremum of the norm of f this is finite right and number d i mean h should be um, we need equicontinuity so this uniformly be continuous so this means that let me just write the definition just for your recall that for every epsilon positive right there exists delta positive right such that um I mean, for every x1, I mean, the pencil is not responding. So let me just do something quickly. Okay, now. Such that um, for every x1, x2 in k, right? Um, if the distance, of x1 
x2 cp less than delta, then this implies that the absolute value of f of x1 minus f of x2. Now I have to drag this to the left. So actually circle here should be cp less than and epsilon for every f in h. Okay, so let's go into the proof, right? So proof. So is that beef will be the easier implication? So let's assume that H is pre compact. Right, so this means um, in the closure of H is compact. Now let's try by, I mean, let's start by showing um, boundedness of H. So let's call it boundedness. Okay, good. Since the closure of H is compact, H is totally is totally um totally bounded. Right? Remember H is actually a subset of the space um, of continuous function on the compact metric space K, which is actually complete for the infinity norm. So and then by our black box, so um the closure of H is I mean total boundedness is equivalent to compactness. So H bar is totally bounded and consequently H is totally is totally bounded. And in particular Point wise bounded. So how do we see that? I mean, it's not. I mean, you can also prove that if you have a set um, H for which the closure is actually totally bounded, then um, the set itself is actually totally bounded. So you can prove that it's not um, not a big deal. So um, indeed. Um, H totally bounded. Means that for every epsilon positive, right, there exists I mean, F1 up to say Fn in H such that H is contained into the union of the balls centered at Fi and radius epsilon, I moving from one to n. So this means that for every F in H, the norm of F minus Fi is actually certainly less than Epsilon. I mean, by the way, this is actually the ball in the space CK of continuous function with um, on the compact metric space K. So this means, I mean, if you use the, I mean, the reverse triangle inequality here, then you get that for every f in H, the norm of f is less or equal than epsilon plus um, the norm of fi. So, of course, this actually means that the supremum of the norm of f, what the f in h is actually 
اس ايكوال ده نيرف سايلنت بوس انما في حاجه of course this quantity I mean is bounded by a certain constant you can call it n or whatever you want okay good now let's move to equicontinuity good so I feel like it's not set Good, so um, let x0 be an element in k, right? And let epsilon positive, right? So we just write what we have to do. So we need to find delta positive such that for every x in k, right, the distance of x to x0 something less than delta and I have to drag it to so that it has this implies that the absolute value of f of x minus f of x0 is actually strictly less than epsilon for every f in, in h of course so this is what you have to show now since h is totally bounded right I mean as you just write y as h bar I mean the closure of h is compact and it's totally bounded So that implies that h is actually totally bounded so since h is actually totally bounded so we have they exist this is just by definition so they exist and in epsilon over 3 net say um, g1 up to um, up to gn right of element of h such that I should have it here. Should write it here. So that um, H is actually contained into the union of balls centered at GI and radius epsilon over 3, I running from 1 to 1. So this means that, I mean, for every F in H, right, um, there exists I0, right, in 1 up to n so this is just a notation to say that you only consider integers right from 1 to n so there is i0 in 1n such that such that um, the supremum and the absolute value of f of x minus gi 0 of x right where the x in k is actually strictly less than epsilon over 3 okay well don't get confused so this is I mean this is um, I mean this is nothing else as nothing else than the norm of f minus g i0 or the infinity norm of this so this corresponds exactly to being in the ball of centered at um, GI and I just epsilon over 3. Okay, now, um, since every GI is continuous, right? Because remember, H is actually a subset of the space of continuous function. So we know that there exists, this is purely by continuity, there exists um, data tilde positive. Such that the absolute value of of the race of g i zero of x right minus g i zero of x zero 
simply less than epsilon over over 3 for every x in k height provided that um, say with provided that x is actually in the neighborhood of x0 so this is just by continuity of the function of um, of the function di0 right at the point um, x0 now then for x and x0 and k right with distance of x to x0 strictly less than delta shield we have the following inequality The absolute value of f of x minus f of x zero, right? It's actually this is basically I mean just use triangle inequality. So you insert um, di zero of x and then you move. So this is just I mean this is a common trick, right? Di zero of x, right? Plus absolute value of di zero of x minus di zero of x zero plus the absolute value of di0 of x0 minus f of x0 and of course each quantity is actually less than epsilon over 3 plus epsilon over 3 plus epsilon over 3 right so this means that the absolute value of f of x minus f of x0 Simply less than epsilon, right, for every x in k, right, with distance of x to x0, simply less than the delta g. So, one looks like it. So, one may choose. I'm sorry. So one may choose um, delta to be delta t. So hence h is if it continues. Hmm, looks like it. So we have a continuity of it. Good. So at least with this, we are done with the first implication. So now let's have a look at the reverse implication. Now, conversely, um, let's assume. That can we call it? A and B, right? The theorem. So let's assume that A and B hold. So this means H is pointwise bounded. Right? And It continues. Now we want to show that um, H is a compact, so let's show. That the closure of H is, is compact. Okay, good. So now observe that um, since the space of continuous function on the compact metric space k, I mean, and though with this norm, I mean, is a complete metric space. A complete 
it took space right by um i think it was proposition one star the very first proposition of our lecture so by proposition one star it is enough to show that h is a tally bounded so for this let epsilon be positive right and for each x in k let call it um, u of x right u x right the an open neighborhood of x right with i'll tell you why such um, ux exists so so d and open neighborhood with um, absolute value of f of y minus f of x equal less than epsilon over four right for for every f in h, right, and for every y in ux, right, this exactly follows, in, follows by pt continuity. Of h, right, good at the point x if you want. So now, um, change the color. Let now x one, x two, x n in k. Again, I will tell you why. I mean, you can choose those points in k. So let x one up to x n in k right be chosen. such that k is actually equals to k equals to um, the union of u x i right i running from one to n right i mean um, let me write it here so this is possible because remember k is compact right and ux right x running in k is an open cover of k so obviously there exists a um i mean finite sub cover right so so the x1 up to xn exists now put um, let's call it h of x right so that will define as being um, the set of point f of x right such that f is actually in h right of course for of course for let me write it down here for every x in k of course and then we define the set gamma to be um, the union of h of x i i running from one to n now observe that i mean those are elements of i mean of r right i mean in this i mean if you assume that our field is actually r and not c for instance and this is obviously also subset of subset of r now since gamma is bounded right as i mean this is because the hx are bounded right hx is bounded for, for every 
x and h. Where we x and h, right? It follows that gamma is totally bounded. So keep in mind that every bounded set in R is totally, is totally bounded. So gamma is totally bounded. So this means that there exists lambda one, I mean, we find that um, epsilon over four net, so lambda one up to lambda m in R such that gamma is actually contained to the union of the balls centered at lambda j if we just epsilon over four j running from one to to m okay now now define um let's call it phi right to be capital phi to be the set of maps Call it small phi from this set to the set again. As, as I said, I mean, this is just a way of saying one, two, up to n. Okay, so so we define phi to be the set of map of maps um, phi from I mean. And they, they set um, from set one n to, to one n. So now for phi in capital phi, right? Put let's call it h phi, right? To be the set of f in h such that the absolute value of f of x i minus lambda phi. I you know, have to create some space. Such that this is actually slightly less than epsilon over four for every um, I between one and n. Okay. Then we claim that I mean that H is exactly the union of the H phi phi in capital phi. And then we are going to prove it. I mean it's not indeed that F in I mean the order inclusion is actually trivial, so we only need to consider the case um, H containing to the union. So let f is um, be an element of h, right? Then for h i in this interval, I think I use capital N. There exists, I mean, write it here. There exists j in one m, right? Such that f of x i is actually an element of the ball centered at lambda j and radius epsilon over four. Right. So, I mean, this is due to the fact that I mean, due to the fact that gamma is defined. To be the union of h x i right i on from one to capital n right which is actually a subset again of the union over j moving from one to to m right of the ball centered at 
and that the image just on the floor. So this is basically due to this. To okay, so hands there exist. The function phi in phi capital phi with f of xi being in the ball of a just lambda phi i right epsilon over four good so hence F is actually in the H file. And then we are done. Good. Now, so H is obviously the union of the H file, phi only into 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 phi, capital phi. Now for F and J, right? Being in H phi and Y being an element of Uxi, this is an open neighborhood, an open neighborhood of um, of xi, right? I being an element of one. Then we then obtain that the absolute value of f of y minus um, gy, right? I mean, using triangle inequality, so this is also equivalent. F of y minus f of xi plus absolute value of f of xi minus lambda phi i plus absolute value of lambda phi i minus um, gxi plus absolute value of gxi minus minus gy. Now observe that um, this quantity here this quantity here is actually simply less than epsilon over 4 right because f is actually in h phi so this is by definition of being an element of h phi and the same also hold for, let me use another color. For G, right, which is also simply than epsilon over four, as G is actually in H5. And then the other one actually holds by continuity, as we saw um, a bit earlier. So this is actually slightly less than epsilon over four plus epsilon over four plus epsilon over four epsilon over 4 so this is actually simply less than epsilon so this we have that um, the norm of f minus d of course this holds for every y in k right so the norm of f minus d is actually simply less than epsilon and this for every f and d in h5 so therefore Finite epsilon net for H phi and this also for H exist. So this means that H is totally bounded and with this we actually conclude the proof of the Azidas Curie theorem and we also end this lecture here. So thank you once again for joining. Um, I noticed that the, I mean, there is a problem with the audio quality in some of my previous videos. So I'm still trying to 
to to fix that. Then in the meantime, um, stay tuned and we stay again. We see again um, each other in the next video.